Hey guys, today we have a very disturbing case to look at, the case of the Mongolba Seven Angels cult. We look at their beliefs, crimes, and what life was like for this South African church and its members. How did these seven brothers convince hundreds of followers to be completely devoted to them? Let's find out. The Seven Angels Ministry was established in 1986 by Mr. Mungoba in KZN, and after his death, his seven sons, who called themselves the Seven Angels and their mother, would take it over in a small village in Eastern Cape. The leaders would record their teachings and ask the members to spread their word, and this became a sort of recruiting system because people would hear this and go to the church for salvation. There is this big rocky mountain near the town and on it, the church painted a big red cross with a white background and the words, in the end of 1260 days is a new beginning. The members were waiting for Jesus to come and one of the brothers said, our mission is to return the world to Jehovah God. Let me read you what one of the angels had to say about their beliefs. As you see us here, we are angels. We come from heaven. Firstly, I am not a pastor. I am an angel from heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Lord. There is an angel that escaped from heaven called Lucifer, Satan, which we are here to hunt. Satan came to earth and breathed on the constitution of South Africa and its schools. We are saying that education is wrong because Satan has taken over schools after Nelson Mandela allowed him to do so. We are saying children should not go to school as Satan has infiltrated schools. People must not listen to the constitution because it's driven by Satan. I consider the constitution to be an evil spirit. We are saying that life must return to the Lord and Satan must go. One of the brothers talk about how they don't need education to become accountants or journalists. And I'll read to you what they say because I can't really explain it. Um, and this brother dropped out of grade one, by the way. Today, I'm able to read, speak and write English, even though I never went to school. In Cape Town, I used to work as, a, as an accountant, even though I don't have qualifications. I told my bosses I only had a code 14, which is a driver's license, and no schooling, but they insisted on me being their accountant. Even in jur journalism, you can show and train me just for one day, and you'll see me being a success from the word go. If you ever needed an excuse not to go to school, there it is. There were approximately 160 people living in the church at one time, and they lived in iron corrugated shacks. Whenever I hear about cults, I wonder how leaders can convince people to do the most crazy things and live in the most unconventional ways and convince them of the craziest beliefs. And one of the reasons is that they target vulnerable people that have either mental issues or health issues because they're more susceptible to manipulation. For example, Loiso was a teacher at a nearby school and he was very passionate in teaching. He loved the kids. It was his life. Teaching was his life. And one day he got into a terrible car accident and sustained some terrible injuries. He broke his ribs, he broke a leg, and he suffered from some brain trauma that caused him to slur his words and he would suffer from short-term memory loss. So this made it so that he couldn't really stand and teach for long periods of time. And eventually they had to make him teach life orientation because there were less hours in teaching that. Shortly after that, his mother passed away and he just couldn't take it anymore and he decided to resign. And before he resigned, he actually went out and bought this brand new top of the range Audi and donated it to the church and then went back to driving his mother's old VW Polo. And then he joined the church and they would see him sometimes in the community being driven around by the leaders of the church, but he just stopped teaching. And this just shows how the church preys on very vulnerable people. He was suffering from physical injuries, from brain trauma. He was grieving and he had lost his passion in life, which was teaching. The church took advantage of this and it worked. Then the cult leaders will normally try to isolate their members from their family or their friends or anyone that can actually help them in the situation and try to make them financially and emotionally dependent on the leaders so they feel like they have nowhere else to go. People were selling their belongings, emptying their bank accounts, taking out their pensions, just doing anything that they could do to give the church as much money as possible because the only way for them to join was if they did this. They weren't working, their children weren't allowed to go to school because these things were seen as devil worship. 
and some of the older members were not allowed to interact with anyone outside of the church or even leave the compound. The children also weren't allowed to have birth certificates. So this caused all the members to be completely dependent on the church financially, socially, and emotionally. It is illegal for children not to go to school or be given the right to an education. So in 2016, social workers and police rescued 18 children from the compound. A professor of psychology who analyzed the cult said that the members suffered from a form of Stockholm syndrome in which they became so emotionally attached to the cult leaders, which caused them to be so indoctrinated and so devoted to them. The Commission for the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities <laughs> warned the government that the church was a cult and they said that these people are going to commit suicide or something else will happen and that it was a ticking time bomb. And four months later, it blew up. So the church ended up having a lot of financial strain because they had to financially support all of its members. So in 2018, February 2018, a group of members wanted to rob an ATM and wanted to obtain firearms from their local police station to do so. They stormed the police station in the early hours of the morning and just started randomly firing shots. They killed five people, three of which happened at the police station instantly and the other two were taken along with the police van and were shot execution style and their bodies were dumped near a high school. They were able to steal a police van and 10 firearms and they were able to carry out their plan to rob the ATM. This incident led the police to trace the suspects back to the church. SAPS, along with tactical response, raided the church and the church actually started a shootout which resulted in seven of its members being killed. And three of these people that were killed were Angel Brothers and one of them was a young teenager. Over 10 arrests were made and over 100 women and girls were saved from the compound. Some of them were terrified. Some of them were underage mothers who were holding their children. And some of them were resisting the police trying to rescue them. Most of them were under the age of 25 years old, some as young as 12 years old, and allegedly they were all sex slaves. They questioned about 40 of the women, and although almost all of the Angel Brothers were married, they saw the women of their compound as their wives, and having sex with them was seen as a tribute to God. The women were very reluctant to give police information, and most of them wanted to come back to the compound even after this whole shootout happened, which just shows how indoctrinated they were. The cult was also linked to two other ATM bombings that had happened in the town, and apparently the cult stole a lot of livestock and farms around it. Six members of the church were charged with murder, attempted murder, conspiracy to commit an offense, possession of a firearm, and there were even more charges. Most of them declined a lawyer and decided to represent themselves. Four out of the five remaining brothers that were not killed during the shootout were convicted of rape and other charges, um, but one of them was not linked to any crime. After the shootout, police discovered that members of the church were planning to individually kill policemen in their own homes. So a lot of policemen and investigators actually fled their homes directly after the shootout because they were so scared of being killed in their own houses. The church was shut down and members had to go home. Many of them were happy, but some weren't. One of the brothers, Banele, acts as a spokesperson for his brothers and he said that they never kept anyone there against their will. And in response to a question about why he doesn't allow the kids to be educated, he said this. Man, that's what, that's what, that's what I've been uh, I'm asking now, God, to perhaps uh, if he can allow us to have the school in our premises, then we... Like, for instance, we've got teachers here, yeah, people that were doing the teaching. So it will be easier for us to, uh, to educate them if we are running away from the intruder in schools. But as for where we stand, we never had any confirmation on that, that children must go, must study here or what. We are going with the word of God, with the Holy Spirit. If God didn't say anything, I cannot move. So I'm, I will stand still till he said, okay, you can do this, you cannot do that. 
When asked about the accusation that his brothers were keeping sex slaves, Vanele had this to say. There were some men who were mischievous and wanted to date other young women inside the church. We have been very strict on that because it's sinful to have sex before marriage. So it's not a problem that the girls were underage. It's a problem because men were having sex before they were married. Got it. This cult triggered a campaign to make laws about cults and religious movements abusing their power more strict and to regulate religious practices way more. I really recommend that you watch this documentary by News24. It goes in depth into the victims of the police killings and it's really informative. So I'll link it here for you if you want to see that. The commission had been investigating this church for months and had begged parliament to do something about it. They said it was so urgent. And after this shootout, this is what they had to say. No one listened to us. This could have been avoided. So what do you think? Do you think that the government was correct in not interfering sooner? What part of this case was the most disturbing for you? And do you have any cults that I should look into? Let me know. I really am so interested in hearing your opinions. But other than that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys are staying super safe and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! Say, uh, maybe I'm brilliant, I don't know.